Part 2 November 7th, 1991 Dear friend, It was one of those days that I didn't mind going to school because the weather was so pretty. The sky was overcast with clouds, and the air felt like a warm bath. I don't think I ever felt that clean before. When I got home, I had to mow the lawn for my allowance, and I didn't mind one bit. I just listened to the music and breathed in the day and remembered things. Things like walking around the neighborhood and looking at the houses and the lawns and the colorful trees and having that be enough. I do not know anything about Zen or things like the Chinese or Indians do as part of their religion, but one of the girls from the party with this tattoo and belly button ring has been a Buddhist since July. She talks about very little else except maybe how expensive cigarettes are. I see her at lunch sometimes, smoking between Patrick and Sam. Her name is Mary Elizabeth. Mary Elizabeth told me that the thing about Zen is that it makes you connected to everything in the world. You are part of the trees and the grass and the dogs, things like that. She even explained how her tattoo symbolized this, but I can't remember how. So, I guess Zen is a day like this when you are part of the air and remember things. One thing I remember is that the kids used to play a game. What you would do is take a football or something, and one person would have it, and the, all the other kids would try to tackle that kid. And then whoever got the ball next would run around with it, and the kids would try to tackle him. This could go on for hours. I never really understood the point of this game, but my brother loved it. He didn't like to run with the ball so much, but he liked to tackle people. The kids called the game Smear the Queer. I didn't really think about what that means until now. Patrick told me the story about him and Brad, and now I understand why Patrick didn't get angry at Brad at the homecoming dance for dancing with that girl. When they were both juniors, Patrick and Brad were at a party together with the rest of the popular kids. Patrick actually used to be popular before Sam bought him some good music. Patrick and Brad both got pretty drunk at this party. Actually, Patrick said that Brad was pretending to be a lot drunker than he really was. They were sitting in the basement with some girl named Heather, and when she left to go to the bathroom, Brad and Patrick were left alone. Patrick said it was uncomfortable and exciting for both of them. You're in Mr. Brosnan's class, right? Have you ever gone to a Pink Floyd laser light show? Beer before liquor, never sicker. When they ran out of small talk, they just looked at each other. And they ended up fooling around right there in the basement. Patrick said it was like the weight of the whole world left both of their shoulders. But Monday in school, Brad kept saying the same thing. Man, I was so wasted, I don't remember a thing. He said it to everyone who was at the party. He said it a few times to the same people. He even said it to Patrick. Nobody saw Brad and Patrick fool around, but Brad kept saying it anyway. That Friday, there was another party. And this time... Patrick and Brad got stoned together, although Patrick said that Brad was pretending to be a lot more stoned than he really was, and they ended up fooling around again. And Monday in school, Brad did the same thing. Man, I was so wasted, I don't remember a thing. This went on for seven months. It got to a point where Brad was getting stoned or drunk before school. It's not like he and Patrick were fooling around in school. They only fooled around at parties on Fridays, but Patrick said Brad couldn't even look at him in the hall, let alone speak with him. And it was hard, too, because Patrick really liked Brad. When summer came, Brad didn't have to worry about school or anything, so his drinking and smoking got a lot worse. There was a big party at Patrick and Sam's house with the less-than-popular crowd. Brad showed up, which caused quite a stir because he was popular, but Patrick kept a secret as to why Brad came to the party. When most people left... Brad and Patrick went into Patrick's room. They had sex for the first time that night. I don't want to go into detail about it, because it's pretty private stuff, but I will say that Brad assumed the role of the girl in terms of where you put things. I think that's pretty important to tell you. When they were finished, Brad started to cry really hard. He had been drinking a lot and getting really, really stoned. No matter what Patrick did... Brad kept crying. Brad wouldn't even let Patrick hold him, which seems rather sad to me because if I have sex with someone, I would want to hold them. Finally, 
Patrick just pulled up Brad's pants and said to him, Just pretend you're passed out. Then, Patrick got dressed and walked around the house to go into the party from a different direction than his bedroom. He was also crying pretty bad, and he decided if anyone asked, he would say his eyes were red from smoking pot. Finally, he shook himself out of it and walked into the main party room. He acted really drunk. He went to Sam. Have you seen Brad? Sam saw the look in Patrick's eyes. Then, she spoke up to the party. Hey, has anyone seen Brad? Nobody at the party had, so a few people went to search for him. They finally found him in Patrick's room, asleep. Finally, Patrick called Brad's parents because he was really worried about him. He didn't tell them why, but he said that Brad was really sick at this party and needed to be taken home. Brad's parents did come, and Brad's father, along with some of the other boys, including Patrick, carried Brad to the car. Patrick doesn't know if Brad was really asleep or not at that point, but if he wasn't, it was a good acting job. Brad's parents sent him to rehabilitation because Brad's father didn't want him to miss his chance at a football scholarship. Patrick didn't see Brad for the rest of the summer. Brad's parents never did figure out why their son was getting stoned and drunk all the time. Neither did anybody else, except the people who knew. When the school year started, Brad avoided Patrick a lot. He never went to the same parties as Patrick or anything until a little over a month ago. That was the night he threw rocks at Patrick's window and told Patrick that nobody could know, and Patrick understood. They only see each other now at night on golf courses and at parties like Bob's, where the people are quiet and understand these things. I asked Patrick if he felt sad that he had to keep it a secret, and Patrick just said that he wasn't sad because at least now, Brad doesn't have to get drunk or stoned to make love. Love always, Charlie. November 8th, 1991 Dear friend, Bill gave me my first B in advanced English class for my paper on Peter Pan. To tell you the truth, I don't know what I did differently from the other papers. He told me that my sense of language is improving along with my sentence structure. I think it's great that I could be improving on those things without noticing. By the way, Bill gives me A's on my report cards and letters to my parents. The grades on these papers are just between us. I have decided that maybe I want to write when I grow up. I just don't know what I would write. I thought about maybe writing for magazines just so I could see an article that didn't say things like I mentioned before. As Blank wiped the honey mustard off her lips, she spoke to me about her third husband and the healing power of crystals. But honestly, I think I would be a very bad reporter because I can't imagine sitting across the table from a politician or a movie star and asking them questions. I think I would probably just ask for their autograph for my mom or something. I would probably get fired for doing this. So I thought about maybe writing for a newspaper instead because I could ask regular people questions, but my sister says that newspapers always lie. I do not know if this is true, so I'll just have to see when I get older. I did start working for a fanzine called Punk Rocky. It's this Xerox magazine about punk rock and the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I don't write for it, but I help out. Mary Elizabeth is in charge of it, just like she is in charge of the local Rocky Horror Picture Show showings. Mary Elizabeth is a very interesting person because she has a tattoo that symbolizes Buddhism and a belly button ring and wears her hair to make somebody mad, and when she's in charge of something, she acts like my dad when he comes home from a long day. She is a senior and says that my sister is a tease and a snob. I told her not to say anything like that about my sister again. Of all the things I've done this year so far, I think I like the Rocky Horror Picture Show the best. Patrick and Sam took me to the theater to see it on Halloween night. It's really fun because all these kids dress up like people in the movie and they act out the movie in front of the screen. Also, people shout at the movie on cue. I guess you probably know this already, but I thought I'd say it anyway in case you didn't. Patrick plays Frankenfurter. Sam plays Janet. It is very hard to watch the movie because Sam walks around in her underwear when she plays Janet. I am really trying not to think of her in that way, which is becoming increasingly difficult. To tell you the truth, I love Sam. It's not a movie kind of love either. I just look at her sometimes and I think she is the prettiest and nicest person in the world. She's also very smart and fun. 
I wrote her a poem after I saw her in the Rocky Horror Picture Show, but I didn't show it to her because I was embarrassed. I would write it out for you, but I think that would be disrespectful to Sam. The thing is that Sam is now going out with a boy named Craig. Craig is older than my brother. I think he may even be twenty-one because he drinks red wine. Craig plays Rocky in the show. Patrick says that Craig is cut and hunky. I do not know where Patrick finds his expressions. But I guess that he's right. Craig is cut and hunky. He is also a very creative person. He's putting himself through the Art Institute here by being a male model for J.C. Penney catalogs and things like that. He likes to take photographs, and I've seen a few of them, and they are very good. There is this one photograph of Sam that is just beautiful. It would be impossible to describe how beautiful it is, but I'll try. If you listen to the song asleep and you think about those pretty weather days that make you remember things, and you think about the prettiest eyes you've known, and you cry, and the person holds you back, then I think you will see the photograph. I want Sam to stop liking Craig. Now I guess maybe you think that's because I am jealous of him. I'm not honest. It's just that Craig doesn't really listen to her when she talks. I don't mean that he's a bad guy because he's not. It's just that he always looks distracted. It's like he would take a photograph of Sam, and the photograph would be beautiful, and he would think that the reason the photograph was beautiful was because of how he took it. If I took it, I would know that the only reason it's beautiful is because of Sam. I just think it's bad when a boy looks at a girl and thinks that the way he sees the girl is better than the girl actually is. And I think it's bad when the most honest way a boy can look at a girl is through a camera. It's very hard for me to see Sam feel better about herself just because an older boy sees her that way. I asked my sister about this, and she said that Sam has low self-esteem. My sister also said that Sam had a reputation when she was a sophomore. According to my sister, Sam used to be a blow queen. I hope you know what that means because I really can't think about Sam and describe it to you. I am really in love with Sam, and it hurts very much. I did ask my sister about the boy at the dance. She wouldn't talk about it until I promised that I wouldn't tell anybody, not even Bill. So I promised. She said that she has been seeing this boy secretly since Dad said she couldn't. She says she thinks about him when he's not there. She says they're going to get married after they both finish college, and he finishes law school. She told me not to worry because he hasn't hit her since that night. And she said not to worry because he won't hit her again. She really didn't say any more than that, although she kept talking. It was nice sitting with my sister that night because she almost never likes to talk to me. I was surprised that she told me as much as she did, but I guess that since she's keeping things secret, she can't tell anybody. And I guess she was just dying to tell somebody. But as much as she told me not to, I do worry a lot about her. She is my sister, after all. Love always, Charlie. November twelfth, nineteen ninety-one. Dear friend, I love Twinkies, and the reason I'm saying that is because we are all supposed to think of reasons to live. In science class, Mr. Z told us about an experiment where they got this rat or mouse, and they put this rat or mouse on one side of a cage. On the other side of the cage, they put a little piece of food, and this rat or mouse would walk over to the food and eat. Then, they put the rat or mouse back on its original side, and this time they put electricity all through the floor where the rat or mouse would have to walk to get the piece of food. They did this for a while. And the rat or mouse stopped going to get the food at a certain amount of voltage. Then they repeated the experiment, but they replaced the food with something that gave the rat or mouse intense pleasure. I don't know what it was that gave them intense pleasure, but I am guessing it is some kind of rat or mouse nip. Anyway, what the scientists found out was that the rat or mouse would put up with a lot more voltage for the pleasure, even more than for the food. I don't know the significance of this. But I find it very interesting. Love always, Charlie. November fifteenth, nineteen ninety-one. Dear friend, it's starting to get cold and frosty here. The pretty fall weather is pretty much gone. The good news is that we have holidays coming up, which I love especially now because my brother will be coming home soon. 
Maybe even for Thanksgiving. At least I hope he does for my mom. My brother hasn't called home in a few weeks now, and mom just keeps talking about his grades and sleeping habits and the food he eats, and my dad keeps saying the same thing. He's not going to get injured. Personally, I like to think my brother is having a college experience like they do in the movies. I don't mean the big fraternity party kind of movie. More like the movie where the guy meets a smart girl who wears a lot of sweaters and drinks cocoa. They talk about books and issues and kiss in the rain. I think something like that would be very good for him, especially if the girl were unconventionally beautiful. They are the best kind of girls, I think. I personally find supermodels strange. I don't know why this is. My brother, on the other hand, has posters of supermodels and cars and beer and things like that on the walls of his room. I suppose if you add a dirty floor, it's probably what his dorm room looks like. My brother always hated making his bed, but he kept his clothes closet very organized. Go figure. The thing is, when my brother does call home, he doesn't say a lot. He talks about his classes a little bit, but mostly he talks about the football team. There is a lot of attention on the team because they are very good, and they have some really big players. My brother said that one of the guys will probably be a millionaire someday, but that he is dumb as a post. I guess that's pretty dumb. My brother told this one story where the whole team was sitting around the locker room talking about all the stuff they had to do to get into college football. They finally got around to talking about SAT scores, which I have never taken. And this guy said, I got a 710. And my brother said, Math or verbal? The guy said, Huh? And the whole team laughed. I always wanted to be on a sports team like that. I'm not exactly sure why, but I always thought it would be fun to have glory days. Then, I would have stories to tell my children and golf buddies. I guess I could tell people about punk Rocky and walking home from school and things like that. Maybe these are my glory days, and I'm not even realizing it because they don't involve a ball. I used to play sports when I was little, and I was actually very good, but the problem was that it used to make me too aggressive, so the doctors told my mom I would have to stop. My dad had glory days once. I've seen pictures of him when he was young. He was a very handsome man. I don't know any other way to put it. He looked like all old pictures look. Old pictures look very rugged and young, and the people in the photographs always seem a lot happier than you are. My mother looks beautiful in old pictures. She actually looks more beautiful than anyone except maybe Sam. Sometimes, I look at my parents now and wonder what happened to make them the way they are. And then I wonder what will happen to my sister when her boyfriend graduates from law school, and what my brother's face will look like on a football card, and what it will look like if it is never on a football card. My dad played college baseball for two years, but he had to stop when mom got pregnant with my brother. That's when he started working at the office. I honestly don't know what my dad does. He tells me a story sometimes. It is a great story. It has to do with the state championship for baseball when he was in high school. It was the bottom of the ninth inning, and there was a runner on first. There were two outs, and my dad's team was behind by one run. My dad was younger than most of the varsity team because he was only a sophomore, and I think the team thought he was going to blow the game. He had all this pressure on him. He was really nervous. And really scared. But after a few pitches, he said he started feeling in the zone. When the pitcher wound up and threw the next ball, he knew exactly where that ball was going to be. He hit it harder than any other ball he ever hit in his whole life. And he made a home run, and his team won the state championship. The greatest thing about this story is that every time my dad tells it, it never changes. He's not one to exaggerate. I think about all this sometimes when I'm watching a football game with Patrick and Sam. I look at the field, and I think about the boy who just made the touchdown. I think that these are the glory days for that boy. And this moment will be just another story someday, because all the people who make touchdowns and home runs will become somebody's dad. And when his children look at his yearbook photograph, they will think that their dad was rugged and handsome and looked a lot happier than they are. I just hope I remember to tell my kids that they are as happy as I look in my old photographs. And I hope that they believe me. Love always, Charlie. November 18th, 1991
Dear friend, my brother finally called yesterday, and he can't make it home for any part of Thanksgiving weekend because he is behind on school because of football. My mom was so upset that she took me shopping for new clothes. I know you think that what I'm about to write is an exaggeration, but I promise you that it isn't. From the time we got into the car to the time we came home, my mom literally did not stop talking. Not once. Not even when I was in the dressing room trying on slacks. She just stood outside the dressing room and worried out loud. The things she said went all over the place. First, it was my dad should have insisted that my brother come home, even if only for an afternoon. Then, it was that my sister had better start thinking more about her future and start applying to safety schools in case the good ones didn't work out. And then she started saying that gray was a good color for me. I understand how my mom thinks. I really do. It's like when we were little, and we would go to the grocery store. My sister and brother would fight about things that my sister and brother would fight about, and I would sit at the bottom of the shopping cart. And my mom would be so upset by the end of shopping that she would push the cart fast, and I would feel like I was in a submarine. Yesterday was like that, except now I got to sit in the front seat. When I saw Sam and Patrick at school today, they both agreed that my mom has very good taste in clothing. I told my mom this when I got home from school, and she smiled. She asked me if I wanted to invite Sam and Patrick over for dinner sometime after the holidays are over. Because my mom gets nervous enough as it is during the holidays, I called Sam and Patrick, and they said they would. I'm really excited. The last time I had a friend over to dinner was Michael last year. We had tacos. The great part was that Michael stayed over to sleep. We ended up sleeping very little. We mostly just talked about things like girls and movies and music. The one part I remember distinctly was walking around the neighborhood at night. My parents were asleep along with the rest of the houses. Michael looked into all the windows. It was dark and quiet. He said, "Do you think those people are nice?" I said, "The Andersons? Yeah, they're old. What about those people?" Well, Mrs. Lambert doesn't like baseballs going into her yard. What about those people? Mrs. Tanner has been visiting her mother for three months. Mr. Tanner spends his weekend sitting on the back porch and listening to baseball games. I don't really know if they're nice or not because they don't have children. Is she sick? Is who sick? Mrs. Tanner's mother? I don't think so. My mom would know, and she didn't say anything. Michael nodded. They're getting a divorce. You think so? Uh huh. We just kept walking. Michael had a way of walking quiet sometimes. I guess I should mention that my mom heard that Michael's parents are divorced now. She said that only seventy percent of marriages stay together when they lose a child. I think she read it in a magazine somewhere. Love always, Charlie. November twenty third, nineteen ninety one. Dear friend, do you enjoy the holidays with your family? I don't mean your mom and dad family, but your uncle and aunt and cousin family. Personally, I do. There are several reasons for this. First, I am very interested and fascinated by how everyone loves each other, but no one really likes each other. Second, the fights are always the same. They usually start when my mom's dad, my grandfather, finishes his third drink. It is around this time that he starts to talk a lot. My grandfather usually just complains about black people moving into the old neighborhood, and then my sister gets upset at him. And then my grandfather tells her that she doesn't know what she's talking about because she lives in the suburbs. And then he says how no one visits him in his retirement home. And finally, he starts talking about all of the family secrets, like how cousin so and so knocked up that waitress from the big boy. I should probably mention that my grandfather can't hear very well, so he says all of these things really loud. My sister tries to fight with him, but she never wins. My grandfather is definitely more stubborn than she is. My mom usually helps her aunt prepare the food, which my grandfather always says is too dry, even if it's soup. And her aunt will then cry and lock herself in her bathroom. There is only one bathroom in my great aunt's house, so this turns to trouble when all the beer starts to hit my cousins. They stand twisted in bladder positions and bang on the door for a few minutes and almost coax my great aunt out, 
But then my grandfather curses something at my great aunt, and the cycle starts over again. With the exception of the one holiday when my grandfather passed out just after dinner, my cousins always have to go to the bathroom outside in the bushes. If you look out the windows like I do, you can see them, and it looks like they're on one of their hunting trips. I feel terribly sorry for my girl cousins and my other great aunts because they don't really have the bushes option, especially when it's cold. I should mention that my dad usually just sits real quiet and drinks. My dad is not a big drinker at all, but when he has to spend time with my mom's family, he gets loaded, as my cousin Tommy says. Deep down, I think my dad would rather spend the holiday with his family in Ohio. That way, he wouldn't have to be around my grandfather. He doesn't like my grandfather very much, but he keeps quiet about it, even on the ride home. He just doesn't think it's his place. As the evening comes to an end, my grandfather is usually too drunk to do much of anything. My dad and my brother and my cousins carry him out to the car of the person who is least angry at him. It has always been my job to open doors for them along the way. My grandfather is very fat. I remember there was one time that my brother drove my grandfather back to the retirement home, and I rode along. My brother always understood my grandfather. He really got angry at him unless my grandfather said something mean about my mom or sister or made a scene in public. I remember it was snowing really hard, and it was very quiet, almost peaceful. And my grandfather calmed down and started talking a different kind of talk. He told us that when he was sixteen, he had to leave school because his dad died and someone had to support the family. He talked about the time when he had to go to the mill three times a day to see if there was any work for him, and he talked about how cold it was, and how hungry he was because he made sure his family always ate before him. Things he said we just wouldn't understand because we were lucky. Then. He talked about his daughters, my mom and Aunt Helen. I know how your mom feels about me. I know Helen too. There was one time, I went to the mill. No work, none. I came home at two in the morning, pissed and pissed. Your grandmother showed me their report cards, C plus. Average, and these were smart girls. So, I went into their room and I beat some sense into them. And when it was done and they were crying, I just held up their report cards and said, "This will never happen again." She still talks about it, uh, your mother. But you know something, it never did. Happen again. They went to college, both of them. I just wish I could have sent them. I always wanted to send them. I wish Helen could have understood that. I think your mother did, deep down. She's a good woman. You should be proud of her. When I told my mom about this. She just looked very sad because he could never say those things to her, not ever, not even when he walked her down the aisle. But this Thanksgiving was different. It was my brother's football game, which we brought a VCR tape of for my relatives to watch. The whole family was gathered around the TV, even my great aunts who never watch football. I'll never forget the looks on their faces when my brother took the field. It was a mixture of all things. My one cousin works in a gas station, and my other cousin has been out of work for two years since he injured his hand, and my other cousin has been wanting to go back to college for around seven years, and my dad said once that they were very jealous of my brother because he had a shot in life and was actually doing something about it. But in that moment, when my brother took the field. All that washed away, and everyone was proud. At one point, my brother made a very big play on third down, and everyone cheered, even though some of us had already seen the game before. I looked up at my dad, and he was smiling. I looked at my mom, and she was smiling, even though she was nervous about my brother getting hurt, which was strange because it was a VCR tape of an old game, and she knew he didn't get hurt. My great aunts and my cousins and their children and everyone were also smiling. 
Even my sister. There were only two people who weren't smiling. My grandfather and I. My grandfather was crying. The kind of crying that is quiet and a secret. The kind of crying that only I noticed. I thought about him going into my mom's room when she was little and hitting my mom and holding up her report card and saying that her bad grades would never happen again. And I think now that maybe he meant my older brother, or my sister, or me. That he would make sure that he was the last one to work in a mill. I don't know if that's good or bad. I don't know if it's better to have your kids be happy and not go to college. I don't know if it's better to be close with your daughter or make sure that she has a better life than you do. I just don't know. I was just quiet and I watched him. When the game was over and dinner was finished, everyone said what they were thankful for. A lot of it had to do with my brother or family or children or God. And everyone meant it when they said it regardless of what would happen tomorrow. When it came to my turn, I thought about it a lot because this was my first time sitting at the big table with all the grown-ups since my brother wasn't here to take his seat. I'm thankful that my brother played a football game on television so nobody fought. Most of the people around the table looked uncomfortable. Some looked angry. My dad looked like he knew I was right, but he didn't want to say anything because it wasn't his family. My mom was nervous about what her dad would do. Only one person at the table said anything. It was my great aunt, the one who usually locks herself in the bathroom. Amen! And somehow, that made it all right. When we were all getting ready to leave, I walked up to my grandfather and gave him a hug and a kiss on the cheek. He wiped my lip print off with his palm and gave me a look. He doesn't like the boys in the family to touch him. But I'm very glad that I did it anyway in case he dies. I never got to do that with my Aunt Helen. Love always, Charlie. December 7th, 1991 Dear friend, have you ever heard of a thing called Secret Santa? It's this activity where a group of friends draw names out of a hat, and they are supposed to buy a lot of Christmas presents for whatever person they choose. The presents are secretly placed in their lockers when they're not there. Then, at the end, you have a party, and all the people reveal who they really are as they give their last presents. Sam started doing this with her group of friends three years ago. Now it's some tradition, and supposedly the party at the end is always the best of the year. It happens the night after our last day of school before the break. I don't know who got me. I got Patrick. I'm really glad I got Patrick, even though I wished for Sam. I haven't seen Patrick in a few weeks except in shop class because he has been spending most of his time with Brad, so thinking about presents is a good way to think about him. The first present is going to be a mixtape. I just know that it should. I already have the songs picked and a theme. It's called One Winter. But I've decided not to hand color the cover. The first side has a lot of songs by the village people and Blondie because Patrick likes that type of music a lot. It also has Smells Like Teen Spirit by Nirvana, which Sam and Patrick love. But the second side is the one I like the most. It has winter kind of songs. Here they are. Asleep by The Smiths, Vapor Trail by Ride, Scarborough Fair by Simon and Garfunkel, A Whiter Shade of Pale by Procol Harum, Time of No Reply by Nick Drake, Dear Prudence by The Beatles, Gypsy by Suzanne Vega, Nights in White Satin by the Moody Blues, Daydream by the Smashing Pumpkins, Dusk by Genesis, before Phil Collins was even in the band, MLK by U2, Blackbird by the Beatles, Landslide by Fleetwood Mac, and finally, Asleep by the Smiths, again. I spent all night working on it, and I hope Patrick likes it as much as I do. Especially the second side, I hope it's the kind of second side that he can listen to whenever he drives alone and feels like he belongs to something whenever he's sad. I hope it can be that for him. I had an amazing feeling when I finally held the tape in my hands. I just thought to myself that in the palm of my hand, there was this one tape that had all of these memories and feelings and great joy and sadness. 
right there in the palm of my hand. And I thought about how many people have loved those songs, and how many people got through a lot of bad times because of those songs, and how many people enjoyed good times with those songs, and how much those songs really mean. I think it would be great to have written one of those songs. I bet if I wrote one of them, I would be very proud. I hope the people who wrote those songs are happy. I hope that they feel it's enough. I really do because they've made me happy, and I'm only one person. I can't wait to get my driver's license. It's coming up soon. Incidentally, I have not told you about Bill in a while, but I guess there's not a lot to tell because he just keeps giving me books that he doesn't give to his other students, and I keep reading them, and he keeps asking me to write papers, and I do. In the last month or so, I have read The Great Gatsby and a separate piece. I am starting to see a real trend in the kind of books Bill gives me to read, and just like the tape of songs, it is amazing to hold each of them in the palm of my hand. They are all my favorites, all of them. Love always, Charlie. December eleventh, nineteen ninety-one. Dear friend, Patrick loved the tape. I think he knows that I'm a secret Santa, though, because I think he knows that only I would do a tape like that. He also knows what my handwriting looks like. I don't know why I don't think of these things until it's too late. I really should have saved it for my last present. Incidentally, I have thought of my second gift for Patrick. It is magnetic poetry. Have you heard of this? In case you haven't, I'll explain. Some guy or girl put a whole bunch of words on a sheet of magnet and then cut the words into separate pieces. You put them on your refrigerator and then you write poems while you make a sandwich. It's very fun. The gift from my secret Santa wasn't anything special. That makes me sad. I bet you anything that Mary Elizabeth is my secret Santa because only she would give me socks. Love always, Charlie. December nineteenth, nineteen ninety-one. Dear friend, I have since received thrift store slacks. I have also received a tie, a white shirt, shoes, and an old belt. I'm guessing that my last gift at the party will be a suit coat because it's the only thing left. I was told by a typed note to wear everything I had been given to the party. I hope there is something behind this. The good news is that Patrick liked all my gifts very much. Gift number three was a set of watercolor paints and some paper. I thought he might like to get them even if he never uses them. Gift number four was a harmonica and a book about playing it. I guess it's probably the same gift as the watercolors. But I really think that everyone should have watercolors, magnetic poetry, and a harmonica. My last gift before the party is a book called *The Mayor of Castro Street*. It is about a man named Harvey Milk, who was a gay leader in San Francisco. I went to the library when Patrick told me he was gay, and I did some research because I honestly didn't know much about it. I found an article about a documentary movie about Harvey Milk, and when I couldn't find the movie, I just searched for his name, and I found this book. I have not read it myself, but the description on the book seemed very good. I hope that it means something to Patrick. I can't wait for the party so I can give Patrick my party present. Incidentally, I have taken all my finals for the semester, and it has been very busy. And I would have told you all about it, but it just doesn't seem as interesting as these other things that have to do with the holidays. Love always, Charlie. December twenty-first, nineteen ninety-one. Dear friend, wow, wow! I can paint the picture for you if you like. We are all sitting in Sam and Patrick's house, which I had never seen before. It was a rich house, very clean, and we were all giving our final presents. The outside lights were on, and it was snowing, and it looked like magic, like we were somewhere else, like we were someplace better. It was the first time I had ever met Sam and Patrick's parents. They were so nice. Sam's mom is very pretty and tells great jokes. Sam said she used to be an actress when she was younger. Patrick's dad is very tall and has a great handshake. He is also a very good cook. A lot of parents make you feel very awkward when you meet them, but not Sam and Patrick's. They were friendly all through dinner, and when dinner was over, they left so we could have our party. They didn't even check on us or anything, not once. They just let us pretend it was our house. So. We decided to have the party in the games room, which had no games but a great rug. 
When I revealed that I was Patrick's secret Santa, everyone laughed because everyone knew, and Patrick did his best impression of being surprised, which was nice of him. Then, everyone asked what my last gift was, and I told them it was a poem I read a long time ago. It was a poem that Michael made a copy of for me. And I have read it a thousand times since, because I don't know who wrote it. I don't know if it was ever in a book or a class. And I don't know how old the person was. But I know that I want to know him or her. I want to know that this person is okay. So, everyone asked me to stand up and read the poem. And I wasn't shy because we were trying to act like grown-ups and we drank brandy. And I was warm. I'm still a little warm, but I have to tell you this. So, I stood up, and just before I read this poem, I asked everyone if they knew who wrote it to please tell me. When I was done reading the poem, everyone was quiet. A very sad quiet. But the amazing thing was that it wasn't a bad sad at all. It was just something that made everyone look around at each other and know that they were there. Sam and Patrick looked at me, and I looked at them. And I think they knew. Not anything specific, really. They just knew. And I think that's all you can ever ask from a friend. That's when Patrick put on the second side of the tape I made for him and poured everyone another glass of brandy. I guess we all looked a little silly drinking it, but we didn't feel silly, I can tell you that. As the songs kept playing, Mary Elizabeth stood up. But she wasn't holding a suit coat. It turns out she wasn't my secret Santa at all. She was the secret Santa to the other girl with the tattoo and belly button ring, whose real name is Alice. She gave her some black nail polish that Alice had had her eye on. And Alice was very grateful. I just sat there, looking around the room, looking for the suit coat, not knowing who could possibly be holding it. Sam stood up next, and she gave Bob a handcrafted Native American marijuana pipe, which seemed appropriate. More people gave more gifts, and more hugs were exchanged. And finally, it came to the end. No one was left except for Patrick. And he stood up and walked into the kitchen. Does anyone want any chips? Everyone did. And he came out with three tubes of Pringles and a suit coat. And he walked up to me. And he said that all the great writers used to wear suits all the time. So, I put on the suit, even though I didn't feel like I really deserved to, since all I write are essays for Bill. But it was such a nice present, and everyone clapped their hands anyway. Sam and Patrick both agreed I looked handsome. Mary Elizabeth smiled. I think it was the first time in my life I ever felt like I looked good. Do you know what I mean? That nice feeling when you look in the mirror, and your hair's right for the first time in your life? I don't think we should base so much on weight, muscles, and a good hair day, but when it happens, it's nice. It really is. The rest of the evening was very special. Since a lot of people were going away with their families to places like Florida and Indiana, we all exchanged presents with the people we weren't secret Santas for. Bob gave Patrick an eighth of marijuana with a Christmas card attached. He even wrapped it. Mary Elizabeth gave Sam earrings. So did Alice. And Sam gave them earrings, too. I think that is a private girl thing. I have to admit, I felt a little sad because, other than Sam and Patrick, nobody got me a present. I guess I'm not too close with them, so it makes sense. But I still felt a little sad. And then it came to my turn. I gave Bob a little plastic tube of soap bubbles because it just seemed to fit his personality. I guess I was right. Too much, was all he said. He spent the rest of the night blowing bubbles at the ceiling. Next was Alice. I gave her a book by Anne Rice because she is always talking about her. And she looked at me like she couldn't believe I knew she loved Anne Rice. I guess she didn't know how much she talked or how much I listened. But she thanked me all the same. Next came Mary Elizabeth. I gave her forty dollars inside a card. The card said something pretty simple. To be spent on printing Punk Rocky in color next time. And she looked at me funny. Then, they all started to look at me funny, except for Sam and Patrick. I think they started feeling bad because they didn't get me anything. But I don't think they should have, 
because I don't think that's the point, really. Mary Elizabeth just smiled and said thanks, and then stopped looking at me in the eye. Last came Sam. I had been thinking about this present for a long time. I think I thought about this present from the first time I really saw her. Not met her or saw her, but the first time I really saw her, if you know what I mean. There was a card attached. Inside the card, I told Sam that the present I gave her was given to me by my Aunt Helen. It was an old 45 record that had the Beatles song Something. I used to listen to it all the time when I was little and thinking about grown-up things. I would go to my bedroom window and stare at my reflection in the glass and the trees behind it and just listen to the song for hours. I decided then that when I met someone I thought was as beautiful as the song, I should give it to that person. And I didn't mean beautiful on the outside. I meant beautiful in all ways. So I was giving it to Sam. Sam looked at me soft, and she hugged me. And I closed my eyes because I wanted to know nothing but her arms. And she kissed my cheek and whispered so nobody could hear, I love you. I knew that she meant it in a friend way, but I didn't care because it was the third time since my Aunt Helen died that I heard it from anyone. The other two times were from my mom. After that, I couldn't believe that Sam actually got me a present because I honestly thought that the I love you was it. But she did get me a present. And for the first time, something nice like that made me smile and not cry. I guess Sam and Patrick went to the same thrift store because their gifts went together. She took me to her room and stood me in front of her dresser, which was covered in a pillowcase with pretty colors. She lifted off the pillowcase, and there I was, standing in my old suit, looking at an old typewriter with a fresh ribbon. Inside the typewriter was a piece of white paper. On that piece of white paper, Sam wrote, Write about me sometime. And I typed something back to her, standing right there in her bedroom. I just typed, I will. And I felt good that these were the first two words that I ever typed on my new old typewriter that Sam gave me. We just sat there quiet for a moment, and she smiled. And I moved to the typewriter again, and I wrote something. I love you too. And Sam looked at the paper, and she looked at me. Charlie, have you ever kissed a girl? I shook my head no. It was so quiet. Not even when you were little? I shook my head no again. And she looked very sad. She told me about the first time she was kissed. She told me that it was with one of her dad's friends. She was seven. And she told nobody about it except for Mary Elizabeth and then Patrick a year ago. And she started to cry. And she said something that I won't forget. Ever. I know that you know that I like Craig. And I know that I told you not to think of me that way. And I know that we can't be together like that. But I want to forget all those things for a minute, okay? Okay? I want to make sure that the first person you kiss loves you. Okay? Okay. She was crying harder now. And I was too. Because when I hear something like that, I just can't help it. I just want to make sure of that, okay? Okay. And she kissed me. It was the kind of kiss that I could never tell my friends about out loud. It was the kind of kiss that made me know that I was never so happy in my whole life. Once, on a yellow piece of paper with green lines, he wrote a poem. And he called it Chops, because that was the name of his dog. And that's what it was all about. And his teacher gave him an A and a gold star. And his mother hung it on the kitchen door and read it to his aunts. That was the year Father Tracy took all the kids to the zoo. And he let them sing on the bus. And he let them sing it on the bus. And his little sister was born with tiny toenails and no hair. And his mother and father kissed a lot. And the girl around the corner sent him a valentine signed with a row of X's. And he had to ask his father what the X's meant. And his father always tucked him in bed at night and was always there to do it. 
On a piece of white paper with blue lines, he wrote a poem, and he called it Autumn, because that was the name of the season, and that's what it was all about. And his teacher gave him an A, and asked him to write more clearly, and his mother never hung it on the kitchen door, because of its new paint. And the kids told him that Father Tracy smoked cigars, and left butts in the pews. And sometimes they were burn holes. And that was the year his sister got glasses, with thick lenses and black frames. And the girl around the corner laughed when he asked her to go see Santa Claus. And the kids told him why his mother and father kissed a lot. And his father never tucked him in bed at night, and his father got mad when he cried for him to do it. Once, on a paper torn from his notebook, he wrote a poem. And he called it Innocence, a question, because that was the question about his girl. And that's what it was all about. And his professor gave Manet and a strange steady look. And his mother never hung it on the kitchen door, because he never showed her. That was the year that Father Tracy died, and he forgot how the end of the Apostles' Creed went. And he caught his sister making out in the back porch. And his mother and father never kissed or even talked. And the girl around the corner wore too much makeup. That made him cough when he kissed her, but he kissed her anyway because that was the thing to do. And at 3 a.m., he tucked himself into bed, his father snoring soundly. That's why on the back of a brown paper bag, he tried another poem. And he called it absolutely nothing. Because that's what it was really all about. And he gave himself an A, and a slash on each damned wrist. And he hung it on the bathroom door, because this time he didn't think he could reach the kitchen. That was the poem I read for Patrick. Nobody knew who wrote it, but Bob said he heard it before, and he heard that it was some kid's suicide note. I really hope it wasn't, because then I don't know if I like the ending. Love always, Charlie.